By the autumn of 1944, Germany and her allies were being pushed back on all fronts. In the east, catastrophic defeats brought the Red Army to the Hungarian border by October, setting up a campaign that would last more than four months and devastate the nation and its capital city. As the Red Army crashed into Central Europe in the latter half of 1944, a huge priority for Germany was keeping its allies in the fight. Since March 1944, the Wehrmacht had occupied Hungary to ensure a friendly government remained in place, one that wouldn't be minded to make peace with the Soviet Union. However, they were not as successful at keeping their other main ally in the fold. At the end of August 1944, Romania defected to the Soviets, tearing a massive hole in the German front line in the region. Marshal Rodion Malinovsky's second Ukrainian front were free to advance all the way to the Hungarian border, virtually without resistance. By the beginning of October, parts of Transylvania had been overrun, and Malinovsky prepared his invasion of Hungary. Alongside the 4th Ukrainian front in the Carpathian Mountains, the Soviets would take the town of Debrecen in a pincer, encircling the Axis troops entrenched in North Transylvania. Beginning the assault on October 6th, Malinovsky's troops tore the weak Hungarian 3rd Army to shreds, pushing rapidly towards their objectives and exposing Budapest to an attack from the east. These latest setbacks were enough for the Hungarian regent and head of state, Miklos Horthy, to make a last-minute attempt to pull Hungary out of the war. He dismissed his pro-German government, and by October 11th had agreed surrender terms with the Soviet Union. Four days later, he announced the beginning of an armistice, but before it could properly take effect, German troops swarmed the capital, and SS Major Otto Skorzeny arrested Horthy at Buda Castle. The commander of the Hungarian First Corps, Bela Ogteleki, ordered his men to push back against the German coup, but he was promptly arrested by his second-in-command, Major General Ivan Hindi. For Hindi and many other Hungarian officers, fear of the approaching Bolshevik menace ultimately trumped loyalty to his region and the desire to remain in any way independent from Germany. With the SS threatening to kill his son if he did not resign, Horthy eventually gave in. Naming the leader of the Nazi Arrow Cross Party, Ferenc Szalagyi as the new Prime Minister and Head of State. With Hungary's place at Germany's side secured, Axis reinforcements were able to dash to the front line around Debrecen, where despite being heavily outnumbered they succeeded in blunting the Soviet offensive. Though they could not prevent the fall of the town on October 22nd, over 500 Soviet tanks and assault guns were destroyed to just 133 German, and the encirclement of the troops in Transylvania was avoided. So severe were the Soviet tank losses that Malinovsky hoped to wait for reinforcements to arrive before he pushed towards Budapest, but Stalin was having none of it. Wanting to secure domination over Central Europe as quickly as possible, on October 28th the Soviet leader overrode Malinovsky's objections and ordered him to attack towards Budapest at once. The very next day, Soviet troops began to push north, but found their advance frustrated around Ketchkomet by the hastily relocated 23rd and 24th Panzer Divisions. We should note at this point the relative strength of the units shown on the map. At the end of November 1944, the Soviet infantry divisions of Malinovsky's front averaged about 4,500 men each, on paper smaller than German divisions, which in 1944 were designed to contain about 12,000 troops. This meant that a Soviet corps was not all that much bigger than a German division, which is why you can see the Soviet units on the map are at least corps level and the Axis formations shown are at least divisions. However, another important thing to mention is the actual combat strength of many divisions on the German side varied wildly and was generally far below normal levels after months of attrition. For example, the two German panzer divisions involved here had a combat strength of just 2600 between them, and less than a hundred armoured vehicles. The Hungarian troops on the same front were in a similar state, with the 1st Armoured Division down to just 700 men. At the end of October, the Soviets enjoyed a large numerical superiority in the fighting area, and this continued throughout the battle for Budapest. By November 3rd, the Axis had been pushed back to within 15 kilometres of Budapest. Attacks into the city's suburbs were halted and then repelled by German reinforcements, including the 22nd SS Cavalry Division. 
With the direct path into the city blocked, the Soviets broadened the offensive to an encirclement. 6th Guard Tank and 7th Armies were to strike north to Hotvon and then turn west, crossing the Danube at Vach. While the 46th Army tried to cross at Chepel Island to the south of Budapest. Through the middle of November, the Northern Arm made slow progress, slowed by a German defence effective at sealing off breaches in its line and counter attacking strongly. It took until November 18th for Soviet troops to reach Hotvon, even with additional troops assigned to them from the Red Army's reserves. In the south, 46th Army attempted to cross onto Chapel Island on the 14th, 15th, 16th and 18th of November before eventually succeeding on November 21st. The Germans rushed the Feldhenhaler Panzergrenadier Division and a Hungarian Parachute Battalion to the area to try and shore up the line. The Parachute Battalion at 1400 men had a combat strength equal to the entire 1st Hussar Division that it reinforced. With these extra troops, it took a further four days for the Soviets to cross fully onto Chepel Island, a slow rate of progress that frustrated the Soviet leaders. Happily for the Soviets, by the start of December, Marshal Fyodor Tolbukhin's 3rd Ukrainian Front was pushing up from Yugoslavia, having captured Belgrade in October. Soviet troops had crossed the Danube between Mohach and Upatin, and by November 30th broken through on a sizeable front southeast of Lake Balaton. Soon afterwards, Tolbukhin's troops reached Setsa and were poised to begin an encirclement of Budapest from the south. Concerned that the third Ukrainian front would get the glory for encircling the city, Malinovsky hastily ordered the 46th Army to cross the Danube at Erchi on the night of December 4th. Attacking without any preceding artillery barrage, the Soviets were torn to shreds, with over 75% of boats in the first wave destroyed with horrific casualties. After a full day of hard fighting, several small bridgeheads were eventually secured, but almost all of them were destroyed by Axis counterattacks. It took a further three days for a larger foothold to be gained, but at a huge cost in lives. 46th Army's frontline would not be fully stable until December 8th, when Tolbukhin's troops arrived at Urchi having advanced 60 kilometres since the river crossing began. Malinovsky's offensive in the north went rather better than at Chepel, with the Hungarian line from Ocha to Galgamacha being shattered on December 5th. The Germans scrambled to fill the huge hole that resulted, rushing again the Feldhenhaler division and a host of Hungarian battalions to the area. The Feldhenhaler was now so depleted it had not even 30% of the combat strength of the Hungarian parachute battalion it was fighting alongside. There was little that could be done, and Soviet troops reached Vats on December 9th. Meanwhile, attacks on Pest from the east continued, with Soviet and Romanian troops trading ground with the Hungarian 12th and 10th divisions around Ishezeg. By December 15th, the 10th Hungarian division had been so badly mauled it was broken up, with its remaining battalions attached to German units for the duration of the battle. At the end of October, this division had set out with over 15,000 men on its books. By February, its last remaining unit would number just 18 men. At the start of December, Hitler declared Budapest to be a fortress city, to be held to the last man against the advice of virtually everyone involved, including Shalassi. His choice to command the defence, Otto Winkelmann, was so sceptical about having to hold the city that he almost immediately resigned. His replacement was SS General Karl von Pfeffer Wildenbruck, commander of the 9th SS Mountain Corps. Budapest's new commander had his work cut out for him. Soviet troops had reached the Margate Line, an area running from Lake Balaton to the city, held thinly by only around 7,600 troops. There, they paused to prepare the next stage of their offensive. Tolbukhin was given command of all Soviet forces south of the city, and Malinovsky chose to the east and north for the final encirclement operations. The Germans used the pause to prepare a substantial counter-attack led by the 6th and 8th Panzer Divisions in the region of the Market Line, but this was delayed by a lack of fuel. The Soviets, though, had no such trouble, and on December 20th began another twin-pronged offensive north and south of the city. In the north, the Axis Line collapsed on the first day, and the Germans were forced to rush 8th Panzer North to plug the resulting gap in their front line. On the Margit line, Tolbukhin had five times the infantry and three and a half times more tanks than the defenders, and the defence soon crumpled. 
By December 22nd, one tank and two mechanised corps had broken through between Lake Valence and Budapest, while fierce fighting engulfed Sikesh Vahirva. This town fell on the morning of December 23rd and was swiftly followed by Bitschke and Herzegalom, cutting the rail link to Vienna. The Axis forces were knocked completely off balance, with few troops on the west side of the river to try and form any kind of coherent line. By nightfall on Christmas Eve, Soviet tanks had taken Buda Kesi, just a handful of kilometres from Buda Castle and the German HQ. Facing the total collapse of Axis defences in Buda, the 8th SS Cavalry Division was hurriedly rushed across the river, with permission to do so not received from Hitler until after it had already begun to move. The Hungarians also raised the 1st University Assault Battalion from students and a host of other scratch units to try and fill the line with whatever they could in any desperate attempt to hold the Soviet advance up. Prevented from just marching straight into the centre of Budapest by this desperate effort, the Soviets switched their focus, moving north and west to complete the encirclement of the city. By the early hours of December 26th, Tolbukhin's troops reached and attacked Estegom. The Hungarian 23rd Reserve Division defending the town eventually withdrew north across the Danube, completing the outer encirclement of Budapest. Closer to the city, Soviet troops wasted no time, taking Pyrrhus Vorosvar early on the 26th and reaching Santendra by noon on the same day. This completed the total encirclement of Budapest. About 80,000 troops and 800,000 civilians were trapped inside. The Siege of Budapest, the 15th in the city's history, had begun. This video is part of Project Pannonia, a collaboration between a whole bunch of YouTubers about the history of the Pannonian Basin, of which Hungary is a part. Check out the playlist in the description below for 10 other great videos on Hungary's history.